Amen. Well, good morning, City Light. So good to see you guys. Um, my name's Doug, and let me just start with a question this morning, all right? Who is the single greatest basketball player ever? MJ or LeBron? Okay, like who's going to be your pick? Or maybe we'll change it up a little bit. Who is the greatest quarterback of all time? Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Joe Namath, Johnny Unitas, right? Some of you ladies are like, when's he going to stop with all the sports questions? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, let's try this instead. What is the best or the greatest British-based TV series of all time? You could go with Downton Abbey. Um, you could go with The Crown, Call, The Midwife, Doctor Who, um, Broadchurch, right? We could keep going. We could say, hey, what's the greatest car of all time, restaurant, movie, book? We could go on and on. Questions like these are so popular in our culture that we've even developed an acronym for them. The GOAT, right? The greatest of all time. Sometime this season, when Tom Brady throws a touchdown pass, even in a Buccaneers jersey, somebody somewhere is going to shout, he's the GOAT. Now, I'm confident that wouldn't be any of us, okay? Because we all believe that Mr. Mahomes of the Kansas City Chiefs is the greatest of all time. He may only be 25, but he's the GOAT, okay? Now, this morning in our scripture passage, um, Jesus himself gets asked the GOAT question. There's some religious leaders and they huddle up and they come up with a question for Jesus and they send a representative to Jesus in Matthew 22, beginning verse 36. And this religious teacher, he says, hey, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? In other words, of the 613 commands in the Old Testament law, Jesus like, which one is the goat? Which one is the greatest of all time? And Jesus has an answer, but before we look at it, can we just acknowledge that this is like a huge benefit for us? Because not only does this question matter, but it's also really helpful to us. Here we have the centerpiece of human history. The man who rewrote the calendar, easily the most famous man who has ever lived, and here we have a library of 66 books, 1,189 chapters, over 31,000 um, verses, and more than 780,000 words. And now the most famous, loving, and wise man ever is going to take the best-selling, most read book ever and boil it all down to the goat, the greatest there's only one verse you read, Jesus says, read this one. If there's only one command that you hear, Jesus says, hear this one. If you want to take Christianity and the Bible and like sum it all up or boil it all down to the greatest, here it is. Matthew 22, verse 37. He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, all right? And drop it like it's hot, Jesus, because this is a mic drop moment. The religious leaders around him are hushed in silence and beholding his wisdom, and we all just got the essence of Christianity in the Bible in 21 words. Yet in those 21 words are an eternity an endless depth of meaning, and an endless breadth of application. And so for the rest of our time together this morning, I want to break it down in these three ways. First, a great love. Second, a great commandment. And third, a good neighbor. That's where we're going. So first, this goat commandment is all about a great love. When Jesus was asked, hey, what is the great commandment? His response is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love. Now just think of all the commandments that Jesus could have picked, right? There were a lot. He could have gone with, you shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not go around your people as a slanderer. Those are all good commandments. They're important and they have a role to play. Worthy endeavors. I mean, after all, the fact that Michael Jordan is the single greatest basketball player ever, let's just set the record straight in our church, okay? That doesn't mean that LeBron's bad. 
That doesn't mean that Julius Irving was weak sauce or Kobe was a wannabe. No, those other players, like, they have a role to play. They're important and they matter. They're just not the greatest of all time. And similarly, not killing, not stealing, not being a slander, and a host of other Old Testament commands. They're important. I mean, they're good. They have a role to play. But when it comes time for the GOAT, For the greatest of all time, it's like Jesus is pulling out his highlighter, getting out his pen, and using all that he can to direct our attention to highlight to us love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Jesus directly quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 here, which simply says, love the Lord your God, which I think begs the question then, what is love? Like, do I love God like I love Qdoba? Do I love God like I love my kids, like I love my wife, like I love my favorite web series? Like, what is this love? What kind of love is Jesus talking about here? And I think Jesus actually answers that question for us within the 21 words of the greatest commandment. And so what I want to give you is four descriptions of this love straight from Jesus' words here. The, the first description is, this love includes and surpasses our feelings. It, it includes our feelings and emotions, but it also surpasses those. And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And to the original audience around Jesus at that time, when they heard the word heart, they wouldn't have thought of like some sappy feelings that you feel at the end of a romantic comedy or a country love song. The heart was the center of a person, like the inner driver, the determiner of their life. Proverbs 4 verse 23 would say that the heart, out of the overflow of the heart, come the wellsprings of life. So emotions and feelings and affections, those are included in this understanding of the heart. Those matter to Jesus, but it's also more than that. The heart includes our will our decision-making, our choices. So when Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, he's saying, yes, with your feelings, your emotions and affections, but also more than that, with your will and your decisions. We love the Lord our God with all our heart. Second description, this love includes all of our breathing. All of our breathing. Really, it includes all of our all, like our schedules, our relationships, our time and talent and treasures, our comings and goings, sleeping and waking, all of our breathing. Whenever Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your soul, oftentimes we hear that word soul and we kind of have this idea in our heads of this unshaped, undefined essence of us that's stuck away inside of us somewhere. That's what we think of soul. But when you track through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the word for soul most basically means the throat, where we breathe, where we eat, where we survive. So Jesus is saying is love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your breathing, with all your life, with all of your activity. He's not really saying love the Lord your God with that inner mysterious part of you that you can't quite define and it's stuck inside there. He already covered that when he said love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now he's saying love the Lord your God with all of your life, with all of your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. Love God, love God. That's what he's saying. Third description of this love. This love includes all of our thoughts. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your mind, okay? Referring to our thinking, processing power plant. Now, a study has been done and found that all of us each day, we think between 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. Now, I would put myself like more in the 12,000 thought per day category, and I'd probably put Eric more in the like 60,000 thought per day, okay? There's a lot of brains hidden behind that beard of his. But wherever we land on the spectrum, it's amazing because Jesus is saying we're all thinking and we're thinking a lot. It's pretty much a thought per second. There went a a second, there went another thought. Now, another study also found 
that we, about 95% of those thoughts are repeat thoughts from the day before. So our wheels are turning inside our head, like our brains are spinning, but we're kind of more like a stationary bike than we are a mountain bike, you know? But still, we're thinking all sorts of thoughts, and Jesus is telling us, take all of those twelve to 60,000 thoughts per day and think them for God. Use those thoughts, use that mind to love God, which leads to the fourth description that Jesus gives us for this love. And it's simply this, this love is Godward. Like it's toward God. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's like this love of ours that includes all of us. We're meant to be bent Godward, pointed Godward, directed Godward. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. This means that God is so glorious, so fantastic, amazing, beautiful, colossal, delightful, that he can occupy all of our hearts, affections, and decisions. God is so infinite that he can occupy all of our soul's breathings and interactions and dealings in life. God is so phenomenal that he can occupy all of our thoughts and thinking. Just consider this, church. All of the host of heaven for all of eternity past could spend all of their all loving and living and thinking towards God and not exhaust the expanse of all that God is. All of human history, the billions of us, for the thousands of years, we could love God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all of our mind, and we won't even scratch the surface of how incredible the Lord our God is. The Lord your God is so worthy of your life that you could give him all of your heart's affections and decisions, all of your soul's breathings and dealings, all of your mind's thoughts and thinking, and there will still be so much more of him for you to discover and enjoy joy. The Lord my God is so eternally good that I could like have my whole heart fixed on him. My whole schedule and breathing fixed on him. My whole mind's thoughts and patterns of thinking fixed on him. And I wouldn't even scratch the surface of just how God he is. How infinite and holy, divine, wonderful, perfect he is. This greatest command of all time, it's the greatest because it calls for all of us, every last bit of our all, and directs us and uses it for all of him who is the greatest of all time, beyond time, forever and eternity. This God is the greatest of all time. So sum it up. What what does it mean to love God? Well, we know it goes past what we see in the rom-coms. It goes past what we could see in a hashtag celebrity romance, right? It's so much better than the choices that we make, the fleeting pleasures of picking and choosing our loves based on our pains or preferences. This love that Jesus is talking about, it is an all of life encompassing devotion to him. That's the great love. Great love is first. The next thing I want to highlight about this greatest commandment of all time is that it's a commandment, right? It's a commandment. Read verses 37 and 38 again. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first suggestion, idea, Way to reach your full potential as a person? Way to become a better version of you? No. This is the first and great commandment. It's an order, a requirement. It's necessary. And when we slow down a little bit and actually think about this. Now, if you've been around church, you've probably heard these verses, this greatest commandment before. But let's just slow down a little bit and think about this. The fact that God commands us to love him, we might respond something like this. Oh, wait a second, God. 
that doesn't feel right. You know, like you're commanding me to love you. Doesn't that violate the real nature of love? Aren't I supposed to like fall into love? Demanded, commanded love doesn't really feel right. It's like the king of England coming to visit the U.S. colonies in the late 1700s. And he says, hey, don't leave me. You can't move on past me. Stay with me. You have to love me. It's like a former lover who shows back up in your life long after you've moved on. And they're saying things like, why don't you love me anymore? I need you to love me. You have to love me. Right? It's like, wait, commanded, demanded love can seem awkward, yet... Here's God clearly demanding, clearly commanding that we love him. Now, this is why understanding the true nature of love, how Jesus defines love is so crucial. Because if love really is what all the Disney movies tell us, right? If love really is this fleeting feeling of falling into a wonderful pool of happy and sappy emotions, then yeah, it's kind of weird for God to command us to love him. But if love, according to Jesus, is in all of life encompassing, all of our all, devotion to him, then this command to love God becomes the most life-giving, delightful, loving command we could ever receive. Because only can God be worthy of such love. You tracking with that? All other loves leave us hanging. All other loves are lesser loves. They can't satisfy our intense and eternal longing to love something worthy enough. For example, maybe uh, there's that boy and you got a crush on him, right? You follow his IG feed and you like and love every post and you try to sit by him in school. You hang on his every word. You love him with all your heart and soul and mind. But then all of a sudden you discover he's not tracking your IG feed, right? And he's not hanging on your every word. And then COVID, like how's you going to school on different days and all that sort of stuff. And giving yourself to that lesser love, it leaves you hanging, doesn't it? That lesser love disappoints. That lesser love can't satisfy your intense and eternal longing to love with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. We can do the same thing with chemical addictions, sexual addictions, food addictions. I mean, we can even do this with like really good and nice things. That spouse who is so wonderful and those kids who are usually pretty sweet, right? Like our family can even get in there and occupy our heart and our soul and our mind, but even they still disappoint. That spouse, right, falls short some way, somehow. Those kids, they just make one bad decision, or maybe the company downsizes and has to let you go, and even these really nice, really good lesser loves can't sustain you loving them with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. They let you down. They leave you hanging. We were made for the goat. We were made for the greatest, and since God is the greatest, he commands all of our love be for him. So yes, it's a command. It is an order. Not a suggestion or mere idea, but it's also the most satisfying command we could ever receive. A quick illustration. This past summer, when our family was on vacation, uh, my wife and I, we had this idea that we would take our kids to go to an ice cream shop. And this is like a really rare, really special treat for our kids. Our kids don't even know how to spell sugar, okay? Like we just took that out of their spelling books in school. So we knew they would be like over the top thrilled. And so that day we were out playing in a mountain stream, having fun, and Whitney and I kind of played it up at the end. We said, all right, kids, we got to leave now and we have to go somewhere. And you kiddos, you have to come with us, all right? It is time to leave you got to come with us. you got to go this with us. And some of them are like, oh, man, like, what, where do we got to go? What do we got to do? And we said, listen, kids, mom and dad have decided this is how it's going to be, and you need to do this. No arguing. We are going to go to an ice cream shop. And when we get there, you are going to eat some delicious ice cream, right? And, of course, our kids celebrated. This is awesome. Now, please know, 
it was an order. <laughs> like if they would have said, I don't want to go, we would have said, guess what? You're coming anyway. It was an order. It was a command, but it was also such a life-giving and exciting command that they wanted to obey. They wanted to follow that command. Our command was their delight. And so it is with God. When God commands us to love him with all of our heart, our emotions and our decisions, to love him with all of our soul, our breathings and our dealings in life, to love him with all of our mind, our thoughts and our patterns of thinking, that command from God gives us delight to love him in that way. Only God can satisfy that love and that longing to love him. His great command for our great love is also our great delight. You tracking with that? So a, a great love and a great commandment. Now, the third thing I want to highlight here is Jesus talks about a good neighbor. And he says it like this in Matthew 22, verse 39. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So here's like another goat, right? Like Jesus said, this second command is great like the first command. So this would be kind of like Tom Brady and Peyton Manning both winning a Super Bowl in the same year. Or ladies, this would be like streaming the crown on your phone while you watch Downton Abbey on the TV, right? Like double goat, this is awesome. Jesus says that loving God and loving people are both great. But please notice this. I, I think this can be so freeing for us. Please notice that when Jesus calls for our all-in devotion to God, right? Verse 37, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, right? He's calling for all of our all. It is an all-in command for all of our love. But now when Jesus shifts to an equally important command, he doesn't require an equally encompassing love. Instead, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe we could say it this way. When our all is toward God, our self can go toward neighbor. Like when our all, all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind is going toward God in love, then our self can go toward neighbor in love. The power to love our neighbor comes from the all-in, all-out devotion for God. So let's just like play this out a little bit. Let's say that you have a punk neighbor, all right? And by neighbor, I mean it could be like your literal next-door neighbor or a teammate or a coworker or a family member. I mean, you all know that punk in your life, right? Jesus clearly says you should love people, and you're like, it's more like I love to hate him, okay? Um, and so he gets on your nerves, does annoying things, all that sort of stuff. I think the world would say, you need to love yourself more, right? Just love yourself, take your, care of yourself, and get rid of that person, shut them out, shut them down, shut them up, right? Something like that. I think religion might say, you need to just try harder at loving them better. Like, do more for them. Ignore the hurt that they might cause you, and then just fake it till you make it. Follow the rules to try to love them better. But I think Jesus here would say something different. I think Jesus would say something similar to the greatest commandment. He'd say, listen, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Give all of your heart's affections and decisions and all of your soul's breathings and life dealings and all of your mind's thinking and your thoughts. Let that all go toward God. Devote it all to God. And I promise you, as you love God, I will give you the power to love your neighbor. Your love for God sustains and empowers the love for that punk neighbor. I don't think Jesus would call him a punk though, but we could imagine, right? Love for God empowers love for neighbor, not the other way around. I think that's freeing and it's so crucial for us to understand. Okay, so we've got a great love, a great commandment, and a good neighbor. Now, let me just close this way. All morning long, I have resisted the urge to like ask us those application questions. You know, like, do you really love God with all your heart? I mean, do you like really, really love God with all your mind? 
Because we already know the answer to that question, right? And no, I don't. Like, I'm trying, but I don't. I know in my own life, like, I didn't love God with all my heart. I didn't love my neighbors myself for 10 minutes this morning before I got selfish towards one of my children. And even in this sermon, I didn't love God with all my mind. I've thought a few times about my favorite truck and how that would make me happier than Jesus could make me happy, right? And that's while I'm preaching about how I should love God with all my mind. Sometimes whenever we think about this great command for a great love, it feels like we get buried under a weight. It can be overwhelming because lesser loves bombard us. We get distracted. We give in to sin, and we can feel overwhelmed. When we ask the question, who measures up to this greatest commandment of all time? We'd have to go, not me. But we can ask the question, who measures up to this greatest commandment of all time? Who did love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind? Who fully and purely and wholly and completely loved God with all their all? Who did love their neighbor as themselves? Church, we know the answer, right? Jesus. And Jesus, the same one who defined the greatest commandment of all time, also fulfilled the greatest commandment of all time. Jesus did love God with all of his heart, soul, and mind. Jesus did love God fully, perfectly, purely. Jesus loved God with all of his all. And part of Jesus' all-out love for God is he also loved us enough to die on the cross in our place for our sins. Jesus' pure and eternal devotion for God sustained and empowered his sacrificial and good love for us. His perfect love covers over our imperfect love. So that means this. The next time that I remember that I love tacos and trucks more than I love God, like the next time I devote myself to a lesser love that can't satisfy me, I can go to Jesus He's the perfect one who always loved God and he died in my place to forgive me of that sin. So I can go to Jesus and experience forgiveness and grace. The next time that we remember, man, we love God half-heartedly, right? We're giving him a fraction of our love, not all of our love. In those moments, we can go to Jesus, the perfect one, who fully loved God and know we're gonna experience forgiveness and grace. His perfect love covers over our imperfect love. But that's not all. Jesus didn't only die to forgive us of those sins. Jesus also rose from the dead so that he can live inside us. And Jesus lives in us through his Holy Spirit, okay? So just think of this reality, all right? The perfect one who loved God completely with all of his heart, with all of his soul, with all of his mind. He loved God fully he, that one, the perfect one, he lives in me. <laughs> he lives in you. He lives in us. So now whenever I fall short, whenever I fail to love God with all my all, I can go to him and know he's going to forgive me. But I can also go to him and know he's going to help me love God more. He's going to help me change. He's going to transform me to love God more and more and more. Jesus died to forgive us of our sins, but he rose again to increase our love for God in real life. So City Light, may we be a church. May we be a people who love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind. Man, like, may we be a family of God lovers. <laughs> Give me more of God in my life. And yet when we fall short, let's go to Jesus to experience his forgiveness and his life-transforming power to love God more. Amen, church? Let's pray. Oh, Father, we ask that you would do this work in us. Would you even begin it now? We're here in this room. We've got our time set aside for you. And so, God, we're asking, would you do this work even now? I think most of us would say, I love you, but I also want to love you more. I love you, but I add not with my whole heart, not with my whole mind, not with my whole soul. And so, God, I ask, even now, would you change us, grow us, transform us to love you more? When we kind of survey back through the sermon and we think of loving you with our whole heart, there might be some of us who go, yeah, 
my emotions or my affections are far from God or my decisions don't honor God. Or we might think of our breathing and our life activity and our dealings, just know we're not expressing love for God in our life. Or maybe we think of our thought patterns and the ways we think, and we're like, I don't know if I'm loving God. I think all of us could identify an area of our lives where we're giving you half-hearted love or just a fraction of it. And so, God, we want to be honest about that. We don't have to hide that from you. We don't have to put on our Sunday best to impress you. Instead, you just want us as we are to come to you honestly. And so we're honest, God. This is where we struggle. This is where we don't love you wholly. Our all isn't all in. And yet at the same time, we know we can experience forgiveness. We can experience grace. But we also pray, would you change us in those areas? Would you bring transformation to our hearts? Would you remind us that the same cross of Jesus where we were, or all of our sins were paid for, you can also empower us to live more like Jesus with all of our love for all of you. Forgive us, God, and change us, God, both. All for your glory, in Jesus' good name, amen.